Hello and welcome once again to the Christadelphians present. My name is Peter Wisnowski and my guest today is Mr. Jim Dillingham. Welcome Jim. Good seeing you. Thanks for coming back. He is from the uh, Dunbarton, New Hampshire area of the United States. Jim has published Bible study commentaries over several decades in magazines based in various continents around the world. He's written three books, Sword of the Spirit, Eight Steps to Reading Your Bible More Effectively, and today's subject, Creation's Gospel, as well as he's hosted a number of uh, website uh, discussions where those books and more of his commentaries and studies are available for full review. Jim has also participated in many Bible-based cable shows over a number of years throughout the United States. In our previous consideration of creation or nature, actually, do testify to the exact same gospel that we can find in the Bible, and we would love to hear the continuation of that subject from Jim, if you will. Okay, uh, first slide. We, first, we have to understand the correct gospel that's found in the Bible, or that creational testimony will contradict those incorrect Bible understandings, like, like having a mortal consciousness uh, or an immortal soul not being dependent on a resurrection to life with one's body for salvation, as demonstrated in awakening from sleep, as well as having the divine nature of immortality cover our mortal frame after judgment, as demonstrated by the unique practice of the human species covering our naked creative form. If we don't get the gospel right, the Bible gospel right in the first place, then we, what we see around us is just going to look like nature and not creation. Well, you'd claim that the testimony is very extensive. Everything from the vastness of the universe to uh, atomic structures. Uh, what more can you say to this? Sure. Uh, let's demonstrate uh, the exact parallel between the structure of the universe and the structural design of the first kingdom of God. Bible testimony informs us that the first kingdom of God was designed and implemented at Mount Sinai through his servant Moses. God chose the residents of the kingdom. He designed the political structure, appointed specific people as leaders. He gave them laws, appointed the terms of their exclusive, uh, uh, concerning their exclusive religion. He even was providing geography for his kingdom, the promised land to which those two yes. million Israelites were traveling. This was God's kingdom. God designed the residents of his kingdom into a very specific structure that perfectly mirrors the scientific structure of the universe. Uh, next slide. Now, the kingdom of God's structure had three stages of construction with the creator himself in the center component, in the tabernacle, uh, his sanctuary. Uh, this was the center of the design of this construction. The outer stage had a four square design with, with three individual Israelite tribes at each of the four quadrants. Uh, next slide. For, uh, for example, tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun had to camp on the east of that divine sanctuary, the tabernacle of God. There were exactly three tribes camped to the south, also to the west, lastly to the north. Four sets of three surrounding the Creator's presence. But, with, but between that outer four square layer and the construction, uh, uh, that construction of the uh, uh, layout of the camp, and God himself, there was another four square layer. And the next slide will show this was the spiritual layer uh, as opposed to the outer political layer. The four square construction had only one component in each of those four quadrants. Uh, there were three separate divisions of the tribe of Levi, the Kohathites that camped to the south of the tabernacle, the Gershonites that camped to the western quadrant, and the Merarite division of the tribe of Levi, which camped to the north of the tabernacle. On the east were the priests, uh, Aaron, the brother of Moses, and his sons, all their families, and of course Moses. So we have this kingdom construction, next slide, uh, in three layers with the Creator, and extending out a layer with four components, and then the third layer with three components extending from each quadrant. Okay. Fast. This is exactly the structure of the universe. I think it was around fifth or sixth grade, uh, we, I know I learned, we all probably learn about the four basic components of our universe, into which everything that exists can be categorized in these four items we can observe. Uh, next slide. 
These are time, space, matter, and energy. Everything we know fits within these four building blocks of the universe, extending out from our Creator like the four spiritual components in the first layer of the Kingdom of God structure, also designed by the Creator of the universe. Mm. Now it becomes quite interesting when we realize that just like the Kingdom of God construction at Mount Sinai, those four universal components also extend out into exactly three subdivisions each. Next slide. Uh, time subdivides into exactly three categories, past, present, future, encompassing everything. Matter subdivides into solids, liquids, and gases, encompassing all forms of matter. Space subdivides into height, width, and depth. No more, no less. It's energy uh, that's where the, the secret is hidden so that God doesn't make it too simple a parallel. We learned in our school science classes that there are just two divisions of energy, not three, like all the other universe building blocks. Uh, there's energy at rest and energy at motion. Passive energy, kinetic energy. A barrel of oil is an example of passive energy. A barrel of burning oil is an example of kinetic energy or energy in motion. However, there is another category of energy that is impossible to experiment with or scientifically examine. This is the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, which created everything mm -hmm. and sustains everything. It is perfectly understandable that this category of energy is completely invisible to scientific examination but still serves as the third divisions for subdivision of the energy uh, category, creating an exact mirrored three-layer configuration to both the kingdom of God at Sinai, with its one component in the first layer, God himself, four spiritual components in the second layer, extending out from that center, and then the 12 components extending out from those four, with three assigned to each of those four. The creator's design of the universe is demonstrated perfectly in his design for the configuration of the residence of that first kingdom of God initiated at Mount Sinai. Wow. Now, a, spi a spiritual confirmation of this relationship is how that first kingdom of God was repeatedly addressed as heaven and earth. This is a phrase that also encompasses the universe, the earth and the heavens, which includes everything that's beyond the earth. The yeah. kingdom of God was addressed by God through Moses uh, and through Isaiah as heaven and earth. Next slide, we'll see a quote from Deuteronomy 32 where God says through Moses, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. He's addressing the children of Israel here. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distew, uh, distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Hmm. Notice how God identifies his doctrine as the rain, dew, and showers, features of creation. Mm -hmm. This actually this is actually a very extensive parallel all through the Bible. Uh, there's a very strong theme in the framework of what is called the early and the latter rains. Yes. Uh, in fact, <laughs> the molecular structure of water is a confirming statement about divine truths. However, our primary point is just that we can identify the universe as heaven and earth. So the kingdom of God is repeatedly referred to in the Bible as heaven and earth. Uh, the next slide we can quote from Isaiah chapter 1, where we begin to read, Hear, O heavens, here Isaiah is addressing the, the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God again, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people doth not consider. Hmm. Besides being addressed as heaven and earth, again, we can notice the creational parallels that God makes, comparing the Israelites and himself to an ox and its master. Mm -hmm. The thing we have to realize in these creational parallels is that God is not simply observing nature and thinking to himself, I could use that as a parallel. The Creator actually designed everything in advance to testify yeah. to His truths and principles. It's, it's the, uh, the chicken and egg question. Yeah. Uh, the reality is 
that the Creator's truths and principles came first. Yes. And served as the template for everything that was created. The principle came before the application of the principle. We see this phrase, heaven and earth, being used in reference to the destruction of the nation of Israel by both Jesus and Peter, describing how heaven and earth would pass away and burn up, referring to how the Roman Empire would destroy that ah, first kingdom of God. I see. Now, if we're, go if we're going to see the evidence and hear the testimony in the tiniest application of creation, the microscopic nature of atomic construction, we're going to have to understand uh, the powerful but subtle nature of Bible patterns. We do need to understand the features of our Creator's righteousness that these atomic patterns confirm, but we also need to understand the, there are distinct numerical patterns in the Bible, certain numbers that are used in the context of specific truths and principles to the, to the degree that divine patterns become quite clear. So, we're going to go to atomic construction. The atomic construction of the elements to define the two elements that are the icons of mortality and immortality. Well, that's As absolutely a, fascinating. How, how does that work? That, that is fascinating, <laughs> and I'm sure I would like to be in the, the seat of a scientist hearing this for the first time. <laughs> well, there is one particular element that defines all mortal life. It's, uh, we learned this in fifth or sixth grade as well in science class. Uh, next slide. This is carbon. Uh, carbon, all life that scientists define, uh, all life on, on Earth that we know of, is carbon-based life forms. Carbon molecules form the core structure of the molecules used in all forms of life uh, to which other atoms attach themselves uh, to create the operating structure of life. It should come to no, as no surprise in our considerations, anyone that has any Bible training, that the number identifying the element that identifies mortal life, carbon, is the number six. Next slide uh, identifies the chart of the elements, uh, and we see from that chart of the elements that carbon is placed at number six, because carbon has six protons in its intelligently designed atomic structure. Um, the number six, all through scripture, is identified with death, uh, yes. mortality, sin, mm -hmm. uh, the effects of sin, such as disease, hard work, uh, unproductiveness. Um, six is constantly associated with the curse of sin and death, all through scripture. So um, we can see that with the identification of carbon having six protons in its intelligently designed atomic structure, we have this very close association between uh, the observations, scientific observations, of the features of creation and divine testimony. Wow. Uh, these are the words of God that can never be destroyed. They'll always be right, always be eternal. So it would be wise to look first within the eternal words of God to identify what element is creationally appointed to, as the icon of immortality because there's really nothing in our creational observation that we can say, well, that's an immortal thing, so we can learn something from this. There's nothing immortal except perhaps maybe the Word of God. Well, where specifically do we find that in scriptures? Okay, well in John chapter 3, Jesus answers a question from one of the masters or the teachers mm -hmm. in Israel about what it means to be born again from one nature to another. Uh, Nicodemus uh, came to him in the middle of the night. He wanted, didn't want to be seen <laughs> with him. And he didn't understand how anyone could be born a second time in order to inherit the future kingdom of God. So Jesus explains it to him in this way, in this next slide. We quote from uh, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Jesus says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof, and cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So Jesus says that being born again into a new life, a new nature, as we've seen in the past, to be covered, is to become like the wind. Now it should be understood that the Greek word translated wind here is the same Greek word that's translated spirit. Uh, it's the Greek word pneuma, uh, as in Holy Spirit, hagias pneuma. Uh, it also translated 
a breath and wind and air. Uh, we get our English words pneumatic and pneumonia, also related, obviously, to the movement mm -hmm. of uh, air or breath. So Jesus says that being reborn into the nature that will inherit the kingdom of God is to become like the wind, like air, like breath. So what's the one element in air that sustains, or breath, that sustains life? Oxygen. Okay, exactly. Oxygen happens to be number eight <laughs> in the next slide uh, on the uh, chart of the elements. Intelligently designed by our creator to have eight protons in the nucleus of its atom. Uh, just as carbon, the element everyone recognizes being the basis for mortal life, uh, is scientifically identified by the number in the Bible by the number six, representing mortality. So oxygen, uh, the biblical and creational symbol for immortality, is atomically identified by the number eight, uh, due to the endless uh, flow of the number eight uh, throughout Scripture related to um, salvation and immortality. For example, uh, even uh, science. If you take that number eight and you just drop it on its side, it's the very symbol for infinity, yes. scientifically. Yes. Uh, throughout Scripture, the number eight has a direct association with Jesus Christ in the fact that uh, in the New Testament, it was originally written in Greek. Uh, there are six Greek letters that are used to, uh, for the name of Jesus. It's iota, eta, sigma, omicron, epsilon, sigma. Well, in the Greek language, uh, the alphabet also served as the numerical system, which is many ancient uh, languages. That's the case. We might be familiar with Roman, Roman numerals. There's really only six of them that added up to, uh, well, that, that were used, I, V, um, X, uh, L, C, D. And, uh, but in the Greek, all the letters had a numerical significance. So if you take those six letters uh, of the Greek name of Jesus and you add up the numbers, they add up to eight Eight, eight. Just as the man of sin is identified in Revelation 13 uh, uh, by the number 666, the man of righteousness is identified by the numbers 888, signifying the three immortalization events that will take place in the plan of God. Jesus Christ being first, and the other two following at the beginning and ending of that restored kingdom of God, uh, what's, what's defined as the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom of God. Uh, there will be an immortalization at the beginning, after judgment, and at the end, after judgment. The number eight identifies Jesus throughout Scripture in so many ways. Uh, a sacrificial animal would not be uh, acceptable at the, uh, at the altar until it was eight days old. Uh, the, uh, David, the king of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God, that Jesus is constantly defined as the son of David. He was the eighth son of his father, the son of Jesse. Uh, on the Ark of Salvation that uh, saved mankind, that when the, when the floodwaters covered the earth, there were eight people on that Ark. Noah is defined by Peter as the eighth person, even though he was the first, he's defined as the eighth, yes. because his name means rest. He, ref he uh, parallels the Savior, Savior of mankind, Jesus Christ, that would come to save ultimately. And so we have this constant definition, uh, circumcision, the cutting off the flesh, which represents, again, spirit nature as opposed to flesh nature. It was done on the eighth day. We have this constant repetition of the number eight being associated with salvation, the plan of God being realized, and of course fulfilled ultimately in the Savior himself in his name that adds up to 888. Fascinating. So his actual resurrection morning was on the, what we would call the eighth day. Because it was the day after the Sabbath. The yes. day, the day after the Sabbath. It was really the, the first day of the new week, but it would be the day after the seventh, therefore, in a sense, the eighth. He was oh. the first and the last. Okay, so the, there's obviously what you're bringing up from Scripture makes perfect sense, reflecting nature, and that there's, there's this animosity between the number eight and the number six. Can you get into a bit more detail, somewhat even historically, about the number six and what it's come to represent? I know you quoted from Revelation, that whole system that. Well, then, that system is identified by 666. There are um, direct associations between this number six and the curses of sin and death, such as uh, one of the curses was hard labor, that we would have to, we would uh, work only by uh, the sweat of our brow would we actually um, uh, get fruitfulness. It would be very difficult, much more difficult than it was in the Garden of Eden. And that was good for six days. We're supposed to rest on the seventh. 
and so we have six being identified with that. We're buried six feet under as a general rule because yes. that's what uh, uh, the earth can reclaim. I never thought that, of that uh, one. And, and uh, disease does not uh, continue from the corpse. Uh, there's really quite a number, an endless relationship between uh, the number six and, the, and, and mortality. And of course, Jesus comes as a human being, six, and becomes the author of Salvation 888 on three stages, and that's why his, the six letters of his Greek name add up to 888. We see that extension from six to eight. That's done a number of ways in Scripture. Actually, it's, it's, um, there's a number of applications where those numbers are used, but it's a little more subtle. Uh, the, the covenant that God made with Abram, later name changed to Abraham, we have a covenant so that Abram would know that his, his promises would come true. God says, take three three-year-old animals and cut them in half, six components. Yes. Take two whole birds, put them on either side. You've got two rows of four, total of eight components. Six halves, two holes. Six and two, eight. Again, referring to the Messiah. And this, we have three land-bound animals, um, a bullock, sheep, and a goat. And then we have two fowl of heaven heaven and earth, that add up to eight p components, six plus two, just like the name of Jesus. Uh, and to go even further, those six halves that refer to the uh, mortal aspect, the cut in half, um, that found the foundation of each of those animals was four legs, four hooves. They, had, they were clean animals, according to uh, Leviticus uh, chapter il uh, 11, which defines a clean animal as one that chews the cud, has a parted hoof and specifically a cloven hoof. Yes. So those three animals each had eight foundational components on each of them, four cloven hoofs. So you've got three eights that are cut into six pieces, just like the name of Jesus, three, six, eight. Uh, it's, there's actually quite a number of them. We can do that with the, uh, with the Ark of the Covenant. The design of the Ark of the Covenant was such that you have six surfaces, uh, top, bottom, left, right, front, back, six surfaces, that are joined together to make a box. Yes. Eight points of convergence where three planes meet. Eight corners. Top, right, uh, front. One corner. And you've got eight corners or eight points of convergence where three planes meet. Six, three, eight. Just like the name of Jesus. This goes on all the, all the way through scripture. Might be a little subtle, but once we understand mm -hmm. the actual truths of the matter, we understand there are three immortalizations in the plan of God, uh, that no one is immortalized until Jesus comes back, the resurrection, the awakening, just like we do every morning, and then after the judgment, the covering, immortality for those that will be chosen. Uh, there's three of those depicted in his name, depicted in all kinds of subtle applications all through scripture. Well, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. You, what you've done is you've researched scripture compared it to nature, and you have helped with, with our audience today unlock some of these mysteries that a lot of people wouldn't even think, would, wouldn't even be able to, to penetrate beneath the surface. But because of your, your Bible study and God's blessing, your, your research into this, you've uncovered things that uh, uh, are fascinating both to uh, lay people and, and scientists alike. We have uh, about another minute or so, is there anything you'd like to uh, conclude on? Well, just the fact that you could, ex because I mentioned that, that scripture is three-dimensional. All of divine expressions are three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take it in any direction, and it will fit perfectly, as long as you have the right truths and principles to start yes. with. The, the lessons of agriculture are absolutely fascinating in scripture. All uh, the body of the enlightened, the church, all through scripture is likened to fruit-bearing plant life where the unenlightened are look likened to non-fruit-bearing plant life, briars, thorns, grass. Yes. Uh, you can take that to elemental levels. There, you can extend this out as far and wide as you want. It's going to make perfect sense scientifically and scripturally. And the problems with uh, science arguing supposedly against scripture, there really is no argument because whatever science is supposedly arguing against was not the original, authentic, biblical Christianity being presented. And what you're doing for us today is to show that there's an absolute harmony absolutely. between Scripture and creation as we know it as believers and that God was the, the great creator, the mastermind, the, the intelligent design behind everything. If science only knew that what the Bible really presented was in harmony, it would be uh, hopefully maybe that more scientific uh, community would uh, agree with what you're showing us today. Well, it's there to discover. 
if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, understanding hearts and minds, it's there for us. But he speaks in an intentional complexity to strip away that natural, instinctive, heart-generated thought process that is self-worship. Uh, if we can get through that intentional complexity, there is incredible, glorious things to see. And as Jesus himself even said, that he spoke in parables so that those who can see would not see, and that those who would uh, think they heard didn't truly perceive. And so as we're doing uh, uh, and thanking the, you for all this great research, we're, we're encouraged to continue on in our search the scriptures for in them we know that we have eternal life thanks jim so much for coming all this way and we appreciate all that extra work that you did we ask the audience to continue to search the scriptures on a regular basis and to look to uh, finding out uh, some answers uh, for any of those questions that you have continue to read call us email us god bless you